Okay, uh, well, good morning. Welcome to session one on unsteady analysis, new requirements for CFD post-processing. Uh, my name is Darrell Rittenberg, and today I'm joined by Scott Emily. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, today we're going to spend about 25 minutes talking about some of the, the challenges with evaluating unsteady CFD results. And uh, this is actually the first of three topics. Uh, we'll start with more of a theoretical tinge, and then we'll actually move towards a more tutorial-based session for strategies for unsteady simulation reporting, and that will be in the next few, week, few weeks. Pardon me. Finally, we'll actually have an overview for TechPlot 360 users on the new release, TechPlot 360 2011 R1, where we'll have a tutorial on unsteady post-processing. So this is really the first of three. So welcome. I wanted to start by getting a sense of how the audience is using unsteady analysis. And so I was going to open with a polling question. And so I'm going to try to do this quickly and know that we don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. And you should see the poll up on your screen. And you can vote now what percentage of your work uses unsteady simulation methods. And it could be uh, anything from CFD, but you may do structural analysis, you may do fluid structure interaction. And I'm going to keep this open for just until we have about 75% of uh, folks who have uh, submitted an answer. So we'll, we're up to about 60%, so if you haven't uh, chimed in, please do so. And it looks like we have about 75, so let me go ahead and close the poll. Sorry if you didn't get a chance. And I'll go ahead and share those results so you can should be able to see those now. So it looks like about 20% uh, of you are doing, about 70% of the work that you're doing is unsteady. Uh, we have some 6% aren't doing any, but uh, then you can see that the 30 to 50% range seems to be uh, probably our highest uh, bucket of, of people. And that's kind of consistent with what we're hearing. Yeah, I think so. I mean nearly everyone is moving in that direction. Um, uh, flow is, un uh, is inherently unsteady and, and uh, um, as you go to higher resolutions and, and, and you're looking for more physics, you, you'll need to do more unsteady. And that seems to be something that uh, in uh, my travels that I'm seeing more and more people, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I wanted to put this in context for a moment. So today we're going to talk about why people are moving to unsteady simulations. In addition, uh, we're going to spend some time talking about the challenges with moving from three-dimensional to fourth-dimensional data, or in fact, it could be multi-dimensional, depending on what you're looking at. We'll talk about some of the analysis changes, things that you need to do in the flow field that are different. We'll talk about qualitative and quantitative requirements. And then we'll actually look at an example of vortex shedding and use that as an opportunity to highlight uh, some of those changes. We want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions. So if you've got some questions that you, you wanted to make sure that we uh, touched on, please have those queued up. And as we get towards uh, the end of this discussion, we'll have uh, ample opportunity to, to talk to those questions. So I wanted to put this in context for a moment. And I think we, we all live in an engineering or scientific world, and we often forget about other industries that are, are running into very similar challenges. And I think uh, this is an area, for example, in the medical industry, and we talk about people who do CT scans. It seems like a pretty innocuous uh, type of scan. It's very popular, but it really illustrates not only where people are going with data, but really some of the challenges. Uh, specifically, you know, if you go back just two, three years ago, an average CT scan was about 100 scans of 512 square, about 50 megabytes of data. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look today, an average scan is about 10,000, uh, same resolution, and about 5 gigabytes of data. Again, data is getting larger. But what's interesting about this is that right now some of the researchers and actually where this is going is medical imaging is going unsteady too. In fact, uh, now there's a fair amount of research around there's a fair amount of research around um, the looking at some of these time-resolved data, 
and uh, specifically we're finding that uh, people are looking at about a terabyte of data, which is a lot to look for one simulation. So um, uh, out of curiosity, before we uh, go forward, if you could uh, let me know just by submitting a question or a chat, if you're having audio problems, serious audio problems. All right, we're going to switch over to telephone. This is going to take about uh, 20 seconds here, so please hold on. Okay, sorry, that uh, took just a second, so hopefully the audio is a little better now. Okay, so again, if we uh, just take a look at, at this data, and now if we kind of extend that to numerical simulation, and we talk about Uh, folks in numerical simulation civil years no no uh, local CFD simulation and more bleeding edge stuff is, is uh, well over a billion cells now well, that's uh, again not to suspect that we'll see a shift to half a billion cells uh, pretty commonplace probably within uh, the next 12 to 14 months yeah, the drivers for this are, are really the available computer power, and the computer power has increased dramatically. Actually, the size of the file has also now that doesn't uh, that implies. The steady state phenomenon here is people that should probably go back about five years, 50,000 cells. Today, uh, the average person that we're talking to is looking at probably 10 million cells and 100 times that. Now you're getting up into 50 gigabytes of data. And that, that becomes more of an issue because not only accessing that data from a hard drive, which is, uh, both Scott and I have learned that one of the and the larger the data, oftentimes the reading it from the disk becomes a rate limiting step. Yep. It's the hardware, you know, it's the one thing that's not totally electronic. It's actually got a spinning device. So what we're expecting is in the next 12 months, people will be looking at nominally 100 million cells and perhaps up to a thousand times that, if not more. And now we're getting into the terabytes of data. Yeah. Um, Terabytes, uh, I mean, uh, what we're seeing in aerospace, but if you, you may actually be seeing something significantly. Uh, 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 a petabyte of data, a thousand uh, gigabytes or terabytes. A thousand terabytes. Uh, that's a lot of data. Okay, we're going to. I uh, can't exactly say why. Uh, we're already okay. We had one person say we're already doing a hundred million cells and a thousand times. So, <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're behind the time. <laughs> so, in that context, we just want to get a sense of for the, the audience, how large are your simulations? And so, we're going to look at the next. Quick uh, check-in here. So the poll is open. If you could quickly vote, on average, how big are your data? And it uh, looks like we're getting some folks. Uh, we've got a one or two people who are in the 300 million cell models, but it looks like uh, 75 to 150. We have about 57% of the folks uh, who have voted. We're waiting until we get to about 75, and we'll go ahead and show you the results. So if you haven't voted, uh, now's your opportunity. 
and we're going to go ahead and uh, close the poll, and I'll show you kind of where we ended up. Okay, so very quickly, if we take a look then at the results, and they should pop up here in a second. Okay, so you, you can see that it really... People have been in, uh, exploring these, these methodologies. Uh, one, of course, being this biomimetic simulation, like uh, looking at the flight of a bumblebee or a dragonfly from our nursery um, story. But uh, there's a fair amount of interest in rotocraft. Yeah. I love this simulation, by the way. It's, uh, it's so complex fluid dynamically. Uh, you see the vortices interacting. It's, it's, it's quite cool. Uh, but the, uh, on the moving body simulations, uh, obviously uh, a very common one is, is rotocraft. Craft, the helicopters, and uh, at times uh, the performance of these vehicles. And uh, there's there's uh, obviously a lot of uh, uh, a lot of things going on fluid dynamically there on, on the, this uh, this uh, fruit fly to our right. Um, you know, other areas are turbulence. Uh, turbulence is inherently unsteady. Now we model turbulence with uh, uh, with equations that, that model the unsteadiness in, uh, in our Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations, but, but a lot of people are going to an actual simulation of the, of the unsteadiness through large eddy simulations, detached eddy simulations, or even direct numerical simulations of the turbulence. Acoustics, uh, inherently unsteady. Uh, there are methods that can model simple acoustics um, in, in a semi-steady form. And a frequency domain, for instance, but, um, and uh, multiple. Physics modeling, the aeroelasticity. No audio. No audio. Okay. We're still, I guess, having some audio problems. I guess we'll. Okay. Welcome to Go to Webinar. Web events made easy. Um, again, I apologize for the audio problems. I'm not sure uh, where they're coming from. So uh, we'll continue to. To go here and uh, again we'll see whether or not uh, the audio problems will fix themselves. Uh, again if you uh, if you're having difficulties with audio um, okay so uh, quickly let's go ahead then and continue we'll go ahead and, and look at uh, welcome to the fourth dimension here and one of the things that we're very interested in is you know, the steady state methods in CFD are pretty well established. I mean, we've been looking at steady state, steady state results for 30 years. Uh, but when you make that transition to the fourth dimension, uh, you really are posed with a, an entirely different set of problems. Uh, yeah, this reminds me of back in the late 80s and early 90s when we were doing mostly two-dimensional CFD. And you'd go to the conference and somebody would be talking about a new algorithm for, for uh, fluid dynamic CFD. And they would uh, um, they would do their present their two dimensional results and say the extension to three dimensions is trivial. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in some ways, it's a similar problem here. We're actually going up a dimension, and on the screen, you, you well, the screen is two dimensional. But we are pretty good at projecting three dimensional data onto the screen in a meaningful way. But four dimensional data, you, you can't project the four dimensions onto the screen. It's just not something that we can comprehend in, in totality. 
So uh, you, you have to come up with new methods. And that's uh, really, if you think about it, we talk about this unsteady post-processing post for the most part where people have kind of uh, settled as, hey, I'll just make an animation, which is, I think, a good start point if you're looking at qualitative information. But the real meat, the real qualitative and quantitative information requires a different level of analysis. That's right. Uh, you know, for the qualitative, typically we use animations. It's something that we deal with on a daily basis, watching TV or whatever. We understand watching things vary through time. But quantitatively, you have to start looking at, at other things. Dimensionality reduction through integrations um, or time-dependent scalars, looking at spe specific values in the domain. Uh, Fourier transforms, looking in the frequency domain. Uh, it's it's still you have still lower dimensionality, but you can use that to help you understand um, how things are varying through time uh, in a more meaningful way, perhaps. And then just statistics, you know, looking at min max, average, and standard deviations of of how things are varying uh, over time. Okay, so what what I'd like to do is. Uh... Let's uh, talk a little bit more in detail about streak lines, streamlines of particle paths. Yeah, that was the final one, is, 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 uh, is looking at your vector field. Uh, it's tricky to begin with, but in, when you're talking about time-dependent data, there are really three different ways of looking at it um, using these uh, tangent curves. Um, the, the one that we're most familiar with are streamlines, and, and streamlines um, are um, well, they're all tangent curves, first of all. So they all represent some sort of an uh, integration through time of a curve that is everywhere tangent to a vector field. Um, for streamlines, the vector field you're looking at is the, is the velocity at a given time. And, it's for, and the whole integration occurs at that time. So you're integrating over a pseudo time for the tangent to the velocity field at that time. Now that may or may not be meaningful to you. Um, for particle paths, I think have a more uh, a more significant physical meaning, and that is everyone understands of you know releasing a balloon in in the atmosphere and watching it move around, and that's basically what you're doing with these integrations. So um, you're actually the difference between that and uh, and the streamline is that you're integrating the actual velocity that is varying through time, and so this gives you a a line which represents a space-time curve. So it's actually going through all four dimensions and generally you either project that to three dimensions so you just see this line that is constant over time or you um, you actually look at the, the motion of the particle through time in some sort of an animation. Finally you have streak lines and streak lines are what is represented physically by smoke, a, line, a smoke line that emanates from a point source like a smokestack. And you can imagine just releasing, part, uh, releasing particles, smoke particles, rapidly it creates a line. And then that is, so that also has a, a very solid physical meaning. Okay, so if we then look at an example, perhaps, of streak line, particle paths, and uh, streamlines and we can actually look at this example as an animation where you can see that the blue line represents the streak line and you can see that the green line is the actual particle path whereas the black line here represents the streamline which is probably where most people uh, will actually use more streamline analysis where it may not be appropriate in a time resolved solution. Yeah this particular this is a very simplified flow so this represents just a constant flow velocity and angle oscillating up and down uh, plus or minus 30 degrees. Um, the, that's why you see that the streamline is actually straight because at every time it's constant uh, velocity angle and so it's going to be straight. The particle path of course sees the velocity starting out level and going up and then going down so it represents some, uh, some sort of a sinusoidal motion. And then the streak line um, is 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 repeated particle releases. So the first particle on that is actually follows the particle path, follows the green line, and you can see as it goes. 
Um, the streamline in this case may not be very meaningful to you because it just is going up and down. And you'll see this in some of our other, oscillate, uh, our other animations as well, where the streamline really jumps around a lot. But the uh, streak line and particle path, either one gives you a good idea of what's actually going on in the flow field. Now, if we extend this to the analysis world, we've talked about uh, streak lines, streamlines. We really start to think about when we do quantitative analysis of time-resolved solutions, really we need to look at, at the integrations in a little more detail in terms of mass flow rate, forces and moments, and we'll talk about that in, in the subsequent slides. Yeah, I mean, it, the mass flow rate is, is especially in internal flows. You're, uh, you're going to be looking at how that varies through time. Uh, forces and moments, of course, are critical in aerodynamics. Um, mass weighted averaging is, is something you do a lot in, in turbo machinery where you're actually looking at mixed out quantities and, um, and, and just averaging over time is, is uh, um, you know, of course, is just another way of looking at your results. Now in turbulence, uh, often you do Reynolds averaging. So you, you would do this, especially with the direct numerical simulations, to get a feel for how, how your, um, your, uh, um, your quantities uh, that you would use in a turbulence model might compare to what you're getting out of your numerical simulation. And then uh, finally, frequency domain is, is, is uh, critical in acoustics and, and uh, and aero, uh, aero acoustics. It looks like uh, we're still having some audio problems and I uh, apologize for that. We're going to try uh, one more phone to see whether or not that helps. So I'm going to put this on mute for just one second while I switch to a telephone. Hold on one second. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. Okay, hopefully this is a little better. Uh, we'll try, uh, this is the last, uh, we're actually going to switch over to the iPhone. We'll see if AT&T yeah. can do a better job. Can you hear us now? I am curious, uh, real quick, if you could just let us know in. Well, I'm not sure uh, much better. Hey, there you go. <laughs> okay, well, there, there, uh, there you go. So if, uh, if you're going to be putting on an event, uh, just turn to your cell phone, you'll be better off. <laughs> so uh, let's go ahead then and, and talk about some of the other reasons why uh, people look at these multi-phase flow. It's about the same for some people, okay. Uh, some of the things that you look at when you start talking about is, say, multi-phase reacting flow, really you need that quantitative information. You need everything from catalyst dispersion to trade. Just do a good overview. But, uh, most of the time, that's not enough. You need to know what uh, you have answers that you need. Uh, you have questions you need answers to, and and uh, to do that, you really need to get to down to x y plots and and, uh, and some of these integrations. Um, you know, we have some examples of how we use how you might what you might need things like mass flow rate for, and how it might uh, affect or or how it might come out. Um, so, you know, an obvious uh, example is, is up here in the left where you have this, this rocket nozzle and there you might be looking at rocket rocket ignition and, and or, you know, changes in, uh, in the thrust. And you need to, uh, you know, your, 
your waves propagate through the nozzle and and uh, up, and, and so mass flow rate is a common way to, to do that. Um, obviously, if you're pumping things, you you want to look at the the flow rates and and variations in the flow rate, um, and this is especially important in certain internal flows. And we're seeing uh, more and more people also looking at uh, you know two phase flow or transient, where they may be looking at oil cooling or you know fuel pumps. So this is becoming an, an area where, again, it's uh, very intuitive to look at both the animation, but there are some significant uh, mass flow rate implications that, that need to be resolved in the simulation. And so uh, we're seeing that to be more and more of a trend. In addition, of course, to the forces and moment calculations, uh, we talk about the distribution of loads uh, as a function of time. Uh, I guess the example of rotograph here, but there's, there's also other examples. Oh yeah, I mean uh, this happens in, in maneuvering of all aircraft, and and uh, you you uh, you need to be uh, able to do your integrations through time, and 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 then you can actually look at at how that varies. And uh, uh, you know, especially in aeroelasticity, where you're looking at the uh, um, at the actual interaction between the structural mechanics and the and the fluid mechanics, um, you know. Knowing your forces as a function of time is, is, is crucial to that, and um, and we, we actually found an example. I might have to move it over. So hold on. And I'll see if you can uh, see that. But it's okay. So what we're actually looking at is again we're with vortex shedding of a cable, and you can see that uh, you get the oscillation. And uh, we have a great example locally of uh, vortex shedding problems. Developing gritty. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Imagine they have a spherical grid. Uh, this is uh, um, this, this is is the sort of thing that happens also in in the the cables that hold down um, various uh, various things like the oil rigs and uh, offshore oil rigs and and you get, you get this uh, you get these vortices shedding off of it which actually force the motion of the table and then that in turn actually enhances the vortex shedding. Uh, and in certain situations that can get totally out of hand, like <laughs> in galloping gurdy and cause structural failure. And, and, and so that's, that's certainly an area where uh, looking at an unsteady simulation can be perhaps more informative and certainly more interesting. I don't know if they've anyone's ever simulated these from a bridge to foster, but it would be fun to do so. Uh, of course, once you move into time dependent, you start to uh, really have to analyze both the frequency domain and time domain. Of course, quite important. It's obvious. We, we listen in the frequency domain. Um, that's how we hear, and and, and so uh, it's it's natural to go to look at the frequency. You know, the amplitude of various frequencies that make up your your. Uh, your uh, your sound waves. Um, and the same thing occurs in aeroelasticity, where you're actually uh, flutter occurs when you get this these natural uh, vortex shedding frequencies that match up to certain dominant structural modes. And and uh, so just to get an idea, even if you're not doing the coupled analysis, just to get an idea if you're going to be having the flutter issues. It's nice to actually switch over to the frequency mode and see where your dominant frequencies are. Okay, so what we'd like to know from you is what are your current challenges in regards to your analysis of unsteady results? And so we've kind of heard from a number of people what, what are the key things that they've run into. Is it creating animations? Um, is it the analysis of the derived quantities? Uh, an issue that we're running into, of course, is loading these extraordinarily large uh, simulation data, or, or is it a little of everything? So we'll go ahead and leave this open again until we have about 75%. Uh, looks like uh, we have some all of the above. <laughs> Taking the lead? All of the above. All right. We're at uh, about 60%, so we'll give it another 30 seconds before we uh, move on here. And as soon as I'm done, I'll go ahead and post these to you. Almost there. Looks like. Uh, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, 
close the poll and I'll post this back and then we're going to actually walk through a couple examples in tech quad. Uh, some people had asked. Okay. All right. Oh, I'm going to time to post process was uh, an issue that wasn't in there, so we'll, we'll definitely add that as a good one. Okay, let me share those results with you very quickly before we move on. Okay, so you can see that uh, nominally half the audience basically said all of the above. So we'll try to address all of the above. As best we can. <laughs> okay, let me hide this. We're going to go ahead and continue on. Um, I again apologize for the audio problems. Hopefully it's a little better now. Uh, let, let's go ahead and we're going to actually take a look at this example where I'm going to go ahead and with the animation, uh, one of the challenges we, we see when we're using a PowerPoint across GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar is that it looks like it doesn't do a good job of updating very quickly. So I've actually gone ahead and posted uh, these up to YouTube, so if you're at all interested in seeing this animation uh, and getting a higher resolution animation, uh, you can go ahead and, and get those on uh, directly off of uh, YouTube. And so we'll, we'll send a link along to all the folks here. Again, uh, Still, the audio is going in and out. I, I just don't know what's going on. Okay, so let's go ahead then. And in this case, what we're looking at is vortex shedding around the cylinder. You can see the cylinder is fixed in this case. And we're looking at uh, those vortices. So we're looking at the, in essence, vortex shedding here. And you can see that uh, phenomena as a function of time. So I've actually done this as a pretty highly resolved simulation. And we're looking at about a thousand time steps. And I made this animation. This is probably where most people would have. Up and I just did this on my laptop. It could take a couple hours to do. Yeah. Let's, let's go ahead then and take a look at an example. So let's see if we can, if we can go ahead and get out of this and we'll, we'll just pop into the check box. So this is an example. So that's the same one I'm looking at. Waiting for the next screen. Um, and I know that uh, the update rate looks like it's not overly perfect, but we'll. One of the things that they say we can do is if we make the image just a little bit smaller, it might update a little faster. Okay. So if we go ahead, let's just take a look at this. We'll look at what most people would start with is just to animate the data. So it looks like you're getting about oh one every what was that? Every four or five frames maybe. Yeah, and you seem to be getting some strange lines showing up on this. I don't think you are. they're not getting that. Okay. No, I just us. Never Just us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of the first step. Of course, uh, this is probably something we're looking at a simple slice. And if I uh, look at that slice, let's be perpendicular for a moment, and we'll zoom in a tad, and we can do that same animation now. And again, you're just looking at um, vorticity here. So you can start to get a sense of how uh, the flow is developing as a function of time, which is a good thing to start with. But we wanted to go back to Oh, they are coming across well. Okay, well, I, I apologize. I guess uh, it is coming across well. That's good to know. Yeah, good. Good. All right. So again, you can go through the animation. And, and for the most part, if you look on, online or you go to a presentation, this is about the extent that uh, people would show. But we wanted to show you some of the things we talked about earlier in terms of looking at uh, stream traces, streamlines, and street lines. So perhaps uh, let's go ahead and start with looking at, at streamline. So if we, uh, we're going to do two things. And first thing, I'm just going to deactivate this guy. And I'm actually using, uh, just for context here, the version of TechBot that I'm using here today is actually a beta that has been posted. But these include some functionality that uh, are not available in the current uh, version of TechBot. So some of the things you're seeing, uh, you'll have access to soon. Uh, but you don't have, if you want access to earlier, we certainly would encourage you to participate in a beta program. OK, so let's go ahead and go to the beginning of the simulation here. And we're going to drop in some streamlines. Now, again, as Scott pointed out, uh, these streamlines are just the instantaneous integration through the flow field. And you can actually see that the streamlines are uh, cutting in and out of that plane, of that slice plane. You can see that it's, yeah, it's on the other side. So there's a significant amount of uh, three-dimensionality to this flow field. Um, even though it's really flow parallel to a cylinder um, vortex shedding. Uh, you're getting some turbulence effects going on. So if I uh, go through again now and animate, you can see those instantaneous streamlines. 
And, and you can see that they kind of wiggle and go around, and you can see there's uh, loose circulation. Yeah, they're jumping in, especially if it's right behind the cylinder. You can see a lot of jumping around of the, of the streamlines. And that's, that's our artifact of the fact that it's actually integrating a separate streamline at each time. Uh, and, and so it, you're going to see a lot of motion. Now, to just to illustrate, in effect, the dimensionality here, uh, we can quickly look at the multidimensional. We'll look at each of the uh, independent axes here. So you're looking at, here's a projection uh, in the xy plane. Here's a projection in the yz plane. And this is the xz plane here. And if we go ahead now, and we'll, we'll do that same animation. We're going to just animate one more time. So you, you can see now that you can actually see that dimensionality a little more just by looking at the different uh, projections, principal projections. OK, so we want to actually then take a look at perhaps a few things. So one of the things that comes up a lot is uh, if you wanted to look at, say, the, the simulation and you wanted to look at the streak lines and particle paths, how does one do that? So we're going to take a look at an example here. So I'm going to pause this and let's just pop into uh, to another one here. So this is uh, that same cylinder. And you can see those are the stream traces. And what I've done is I've added in some streak lines. So we're going to go ahead and, and animate those now. Yeah, the, street, the particles actually represent the, those particles released. As I mentioned before, frequent release of particles, and they're connected by a line. Those are the streak lines. And, and so you're actually getting um, uh, a, a view of, of both particle paths and street lines here. So if we uh, then switch over, we talked about, remember the green line that we showed in a moment. If we delete all of these, we can go ahead now and show, say, the particle paths. And we can calculate those as well. So if we show them, you can see that the particle paths don't animate because this is actually the path over time. Yeah, this is the path through space time projected back into into the three dimensions of space. So you're, you're, they're not going to change. That's actually the path that the particle takes um, as, it's, as it goes through time. So you can see then you can get a lot more information then by looking at, say, the stream traces, uh, or I'm sorry, the streak line, which is just looking at simple stream traces. So let's go ahead and delete all these. They're not overly important. We'll go back to showing a, a nicer surface here. Um, and perhaps we'll, we'll look at uh, a different axis surface very quickly. How about just process any magnitude and uh, surface like that. So there's the, the vortices that we can quickly show here. And, and again, uh, we can do that, that kind of animation. Now, one of the things that people have often asked about is, well, you know, when I put together a PowerPoint presentation, they want to be able to look at say deltas between time steps, or even to take a look at, at multiple time steps. And perhaps uh, it would be easier to see that using a simple slice, where we'll just look at well. OK. So if you can imagine, oftentimes you want to show, say, a different time step. And one of the things that uh, we've done and will be available in our next version of TechBot is how to make this as easy as possible. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this frame, and I'll paste a couple in here. See how many I want to do. Uh, seven, seven, and if I just tile those very quickly, uh, let's make an array here. And now I have an array of each one of these plots, and you can see that they're all identical. And I can go through now and look at each one and do a delta of time step. Now we're working on making this a little more automated, but I think it's worth just exploring how you can take a look at each one of these. So you can have multiple time steps on here. And in, in effect, if we wanted to look at well, what is the time there, you can just quickly use time equals, and then it's the solution time. So in effect, we'll just add in solution time here. So then once we have the solution time on the screen here, there's a couple of things. You know, again, if you're doing your analysis, you may want to look at multiple scalars. See that the times may or may not be the same. If you wanted all the times to be the same and look at different scalars, again, we built in the capability 
to link solution time across volumes so that supply. And then what that does is if I hit animate now you can see that all the frames will animate simultaneously. So it gives you uh, okay, how big are these files and uh, how long how are they loaded and how long they're take. Very good question. Uh, this is about two and a half gigs of data, it's about eighty million cells total. Each time step must be uh, close to a million cells. So not very big. That's a good question. Okay, so you, you can see I'll go ahead and pause this. So then I can really interrogate time. Well, if I want to get in and do a little more quantitative analysis, I also have the opportunity to analyze on a point how things are changing as a function of time. So I'm going to create yeah, a quick view of the data here. Now I can actually click anywhere in the domain and create uh, a new, say, store through time. Again, it gives me an opportunity to quantify the results on screen. Yeah, this is critical, and this is a new capability, but, um, you know, just, just looking at the, how things vary in a given time is only part of the picture. You need to be looking, bringing in the fourth dimension and actually doing your analysis through the, fourth, through the time dimension as well. And so um, this, is, this is, a, a, is, is going to help people a lot with their end study simulation. Well, a couple other things, uh, and then we'll kind of open it up to questions, and we'll, we'll keep open on uh, up on over here. Uh, we have added a couple who are looking at simulations on the plot three front, which is where these data come from. We now have the ability to load um, grid and multiple grid and multiple uh, solution files. So that was one thing that we added on the uh, CGNS front. We had a fair amount of interest in. Uh, looking at CGNS file, uh, so we've actually updated. Uh, we've had the ability now to load multiple CGNS files as well. So we've done a fair amount to kind of address how these data are uh, are being loaded. Okay. Uh, the computer hardware requirements. Okay. Uh, well, let's actually. Why don't we go ahead then and. Uh, Let's just quickly summarize, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to questions. It looks like we have quite a few questions here, so uh, let's quickly summarize, and then we'll, we'll get to answering some of these questions. Again, if you've got some questions, uh, we have oh, quite a few here, but if you would uh, go ahead and start typing those in, and uh, we'll go ahead and address them. So let me. While he's doing that, I'll, I'll answer a couple of them. Do you support overflow adaptive grids? Um, yes, we do. Uh, Vorticity and non-uniform grid and across block interfaces, yes. Um, in terms of computer requirements, uh, the computer that I've done all the work on for this is an Intel quad core. I've got about 8 gigs of RAM running Windows 7. It's a laptop, actually. And, uh, and for me, I, I think I was able to load uh, 2,000 time steps, so that, that's probably not too big. Uh, there's the new CGNS data loader read and support HDF5 format. A lot at this point. Um, that, that's actually interesting. Um, I, we, we can do that, um, and we're doing it now, but we haven't yet done that. Um, just quickly to summarize, so we've, we've talked about why people are moving to unsteady results. We've talked about some of the challenges with the fourth dimension. Uh, one of the things that we want to spend time on in the subsequent sessions would be strategies for both animation integration and FFTs. So uh, that'll be something we'll be talking about in our next session. Uh, the other thing that uh, we're just hinting at, but the fact is data is going to grow. It's going to be, as someone already pointed out, we're looking at 100 million cells in a thousand time steps today. Uh, that's some change. People are going to be looking at half a billion on study. So. Uh, we're looking at different strategies on how we can keep pace with data size, uh, perhaps in a, in a novel way. Right. I uh, don't want to go into too much depth there, but in the end, it comes down to getting the data off the disk and then utilizing, effectively utilizing the memory you have. So um, going forward there. 
And uh, that's just a precursor. So uh, we do have two more topics coming up. One will be a little more tactical around strategies for uh, unstudy simulation reporting, and that's going to be mostly around quantitative analysis uh, and some animation creation. Uh, in the last, we'll talk about uh, the release of Black 360 2011, which we're targeting for towards the end of the first quarter, beginning of the second. And let's go ahead and uh, start to get to the functions. There was a question about the uh, accuracy of the calculation scheme on vorticity. It's slightly different with ordered and, and uh, unstructured grids. With ordered grids, it is uh, second order accurate uh, center and time uh, differencing for the of the velocities. And with uh, with uh, unstructured. Uh, it is uh, uses a moving least squared scheme. Uh, actually, I think it works out to third order in space. Um, and there, somebody said they saw some discontinuities. Uh, discontinuities can occur if you're dealing with um, adaptive grids where where the lines don't match up. You get some slight discontinuities because there's an added line there. It's depending on how it's how it's handled in the actual grid. Um, uh, there, was, there was a good question on uh, parallel processing, in particular for unsteady data sets. Um, today, we're still mostly shared memory, although, again, as uh, Scott pointed out, one of the key things that uh, we're evaluating is how to get it off the disk as quickly as possible. Uh, it looks like there's a question around. We do use, we do, by the way, pretty much all of these heavy duty calculations using use multiple threads. So we are utilizing the cores available on the, the CPU. Um, there were some questions about looking at uh, structural data. Uh, for those people who are interested in more of the structural analysis and perhaps a little less on the fluid side, um, we haven't really talked about that. However, we do have those capabilities as well. And perhaps uh, we'll add that to our to-do list and perhaps put on a, a little more of a seminar around how one can analyze results from structural data. Um, looks like there's a question around shock locators. Where's the what about transient shock locators? Oh, um, well, that's a good question. I, I think uh, uh, you're, you're you're thinking in terms of a, a uh, um, shock feature extraction and transient flow. Um, I don't I don't have a good answer to that. <laughs> and uh, Andrew, we'll we'll follow up. With we'll, we'll follow up with you, and uh, we'll try to send that out to the audience. Uh, we didn't talk about the time average capabilities, but perhaps it's worth uh, just showing you quickly since uh, it's pretty easy to do. We do have the capability at this point to uh, integrate over time, and we're still working on making this a little easier, so there's still some work to be done there. But if we I'll just look at a, a scalar integral of, say, vorticity and magnitude, uh, and we can actually select a series of, say, just the uh, isosurfaces here. Each one is at a, a given time step, so there are about 50 of those or so. And if I just uh, go ahead and integrate those, we can actually integrate across. So we're, we're looking at uh, integrating across each one of these, and we'll actually get a list. I forgot to plot the results, but you can plot the results as well. So. Here represents then the uh, average of those values, integrated values on the ice surface of vorticity. Okay, uh, a while ago I had a problem with loading 255 files, totaling about 8 gigabytes. That's why I loaded those files, and even though the recorder machine had a lot of memory, could not save the layout and save the whole data. Um, I'd be curious to know, you know, whether or not you're looking at the most current version of Plot. We have made some significant improvements. Yeah, over the last uh, two years, I guess, uh, you know, we've improved the performance of TechPlot by an order of, uh, well, a factor of three or so. And uh, and so it really depends. And, and identified sort of some of these bottlenecks. So, um, TechPlot 360, yeah, they were all called 360. So it, it would be, I would say, uh, get the latest version. If you don't have it, if you do have it, um, you know, you can contact us offline, and we'll and we'll help you with that. Um, for those people who are interested, we will post the uh, slide deck, so you're more than welcome to uh, keep a copy of that as well. 
Um, okay, uh, let's see. Oh, is there another option exporting movies and loading frames in ABI? Yes, uh, we actually have uh, the new version will have an MP4 export. Um, and uh, there's a couple of other uh, options we've had around for a while. Yeah, we, we added MPEG-4. MPEG that's certainly uh, one that's come up quite a bit. Can you generate the uh, visualization for 3D glasses? Not yet. Not yet. But I suspect <laughs> that's coming. Yeah. Long chance not here to say it away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's listening, though. Uh, uh, okay. Um, I'm using software on Mac here. Hot 3D loader. Uh, yes. I'm assuming that that question related to the plot 3D loader and time accurate solution is related to moving grids. And yes, the new version of TechBlock can handle um, moving grids or, or changing grids, you know, in uh, with plot 3D files. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, so if you uh, want to go ahead and, and ask now, we'll still have a couple on here. Uh, Comment on the time average capability. Did you did you mention that? Yeah. Well, I, I just uh, did the integration. Yeah. I did a simple scaler, but uh, if we wanted to, we had, we also can do the average as well. Typically, there you end up with a data set that represents time as one of the variables, and then you can do the the averaging over time. And uh, of course, uh, if we do that integration, one of the things that uh, we're implementing, and I don't think it's in the build that I have right now, is uh, the ability to plot that as a function of time. So that's forthcoming. Okay. Uh, will you have a native open foam loader? Good question. Uh, we're working on some strategies around that, but I can't comment on when that'll be available. I, I don't I don't know any more than you on that, but yes, I we are working the problem. Let's just leave it there. Well I am curious, uh, hey, are you gonna have a Statistics calculator, min, max. Uh, we, we do already have statistics in TechBot. I don't know if I haven't loaded it in fact, I didn't load it, but we, we do have uh, statistics capabilities built into TechBot. Say on spot, so yeah, it, we have a simple, it's actually an add-on, and you can load it, um, you know, go to the manual, it'll tell you how to do that, but it's, it's, uh, it's stat, I think yeah. it's stat, stat uh, DLL if you're on a Windows machine. We have time for one more question. Well, give you a second to type. I think we hit most of these, although non uniform mesh. Uh, uh, we missed any early one. Okay, uh, the low volume. I think we're good. The okay, last question. Uh, we have someone who's asking about. Laminar turbulent uh, transition on or MAV wings. I think it's just like a work for the, that type of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's very interesting. That's pretty exciting, actually. I'd like to see that. Okay. Uh, did I do include them on? Uh, okay. Wait, uh, can we switch on and off the strand ID? Um, so we have a strand editor um, where you can go in and 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 change those. Um, I'm not sure if that's what your question was exactly, but uh, yeah, so the, it looks like that's what your question Yeah, was. there is. Uh, we built in that capability a while ago, so you have the opportunity to, in fact, edit the time strand, which uh, depending on the plot, you can actually edit time strands and you can build in additional time strands. Uh, will we fix the audio? <laughs> sure. Sure do hope we can. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's a top priority. Yeah. Um, could you show me the input data options? The okay. last thing we'll show here is just quickly, these are the uh, data types that we can load, and they range from the typical uh, structural codes to common CFC codes. Okay. Well, again, wanted to thank everyone. I'm sure if you have additional questions, feel free to go ahead and email us, and we'll uh, make it a point of getting back to you. Uh, anyone superpose time accurate plots to be issues? Uh, that, that, that actually might not be uh, difficult either. I, don't know. I think it's fun by looking at it. 
I've had a couple examples I don't want to load right now, but uh, you can you can actually look at a time accurate CD plot. Right, and you can you can superimpose it, um, and uh, um, yeah, I think we can do what you're asking, but. Well, yeah, and so yeah, and in fact, if you're interested in a little more detail on that, perhaps uh, we can take that offline and just kind of get a little more detailed answer. Well, again, thank you everyone for uh, spending some time with us this morning. Really appreciate uh, your attendance. Uh, profile for multiple things, multiple sounds available. We'll put that offline. Um, again, thank you, and we have the next session coming up. It will be a lot more tactical. Uh, please, if you have some things that you'd like to make sure that are covered, feel free to email us and let us know the things that you'd like to see, and uh, we'll make sure that we cover that on our next webinar. Yes, thank you, everyone. I'm sorry about the uh, audio problems. We'll certainly try to figure that out before the next one. Yes.